So is it time to uh, introduce Mark? I think it is. So uh, Mark? Yeah, so I talked about um, actually my FAA check ride instructor, um, Mark Nathanson. And so we real treat to have him uh, be a guest speaker here today. So I think you'll find it very exciting. So um, yesterday you heard from Laz, an F-22 pilot, talking about that type of work here. Actually, um, although Mark has a varied experience starting from the military through commercial aviation has is also very relevant to the folks here is an instructor here at the local um, school at Bedford East Coast Aero Club and is a designated FAA examiner so he might be one of your examiners and we've been hearing throughout the class some questions about FAA regulations uh, the, the oral exam the check ride so this would be the person to ask but our particular focus here uh, Mark teaches aerobatics and so this is really as we had all those questions about stalls and spins and stability uh, we're going to hear a little bit about um, aerobatics and maybe get you interested in uh, doing some aerobatic flights after you get your private pilot yeah one of the great things about the US is that you know all the cool stuff you see on YouTube uh, it's actually possible to do a lot of that just by going down to the local flight school there are flight schools all over the United States uh, not every flight school certainly that have uh, aerobatic aircraft, and uh, you can be going up and spinning around, uh, you know, uh, or doing loops uh, next week at uh, a tremendous number of locations. So that's one of the great things about the US. Uh, not everywhere, of course, will you find somebody as great as Mark, but. Uh... So thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, bringing your attention to some uh, of the periodicals that you can get. I see some down here that uh, somebody put down there, but AOPA is a wonderful organization, lots of training online, not a bad idea prior to taking your test, test uh, practical test for your check ride. For aerobatics, we have the Aerobatic Club of America, and they put also put out a magazine. Um, okay. Let's see, this one here. I think I'm either going to change slides or launch missiles against somebody. I'm not sure. Okay. See, this is, is this backwards? The bottom one's backwards. I think we skipped a slide. Nope. Okay. Um, along with my other credits, I was uh, Chief of Flight Safety for uh, Air Defense Tactical Air Command out at Langley Air Force Base. So I got to see a lot of accidents and talk to the survivors. And I'll tell you a little story about uh, somebody who had an accident in their story and uh, why we must always be vision and vigilant and clear. I was also the director of operations of a, um, of a jet unit out in uh, California. And um, so that's a little bit about my background. I started out as a civilian before I went into the military, which helped me in the military because I was already teaching and teaching aerobatics, which helped. What is uh, aerobatics? Why do people do it? Some of these slides Philip inserted and I haven't had that much time to really digest and ex decide what I'm going to say on these things, but um, I'll, I may repeat myself as a result, so I uh, ask for your uh, indulgence with that. But uh, aerobatics is basically not straight and level. It's not your level turns. It's not your climbs and descents necessarily. It's a combination of all those things to include, include further into those dimensions loops, rolls, and uh, other maneuvers. Aerobatic airplanes, um, we have the extra. Um, surprised you didn't put that picture you took of me on it. <laughs> but I own an extra. I had a pit special. Aer this airplane, just like the pits, is plus and minus 10 Gs. The center spar is two 10 G spars, so it can pull a lot of aerobatics. Um, Oxana has flown that, I believe, right, with Sheldon? And I think uh, Philip has also flown the, um, was the Game Bird recently. Um, and uh, those are unlimited aerobatic airplanes. Normally you see them at air shows. Um, other airplanes we have, well, that's another extra, whoops. That's an extra doing knife edge flight. Um, we don't normally, that's not a maneuver in aerobatic competition but you come and fly and learn aerobatics, we will teach you that. And basically, we think of the wing as producing lift. In this case, the fuselage is producing lift. Yes, no, thumbs up? All right, thumbs up. Um, 
some of the aerobatic maneuvers that you will learn. And remember, you, here's the thing about the private pilot effort. How many of you have flown already? Anything? OK. Also, some of you have. How many have soloed an aircraft? OK. You don't count. <laughs> you have to learn it. OK, so you've soloed aircraft already. Um, where I teach at East Coast Aero Club at Hanscom, we ask you to do, you don't have to, but we ask you and we, and we offer to you pre-solo spin training. Makes you a better uh, prepared for that eventuality. Just in case it happens, we want you to know what leads up to it and also if you get into a spin because you're nervous and in the traffic pattern, how to get out of it. We teach some very simple ways and we take you up and uh, after the ground school, we have you do spins and several different entries to show you the ways and that the aircraft can enter and also the forces that are required for the aircraft to realize in order to spin. So um, there are some people who've taken spin training and aerobatic training while they've gone through their private, and that is a possibility if you choose to do that. We usually hold in the reins a little bit and say, you're doing too many aerobatics, let's go ahead and finish the private pilot certificate and earn that, and then we'll finish you up, and by then you'll be able to fly our, our super decathlon that, that uh, Philip knows all about. Um, so the loop, uh, here we have, this is really cool. Two aircraft in formation upside down, four to six Gs when you start the pull, negative two Gs. Each maneuver in a sequence of maneuvers begins with a dot. They all start with a straight line, level flight, and they end with level flight. And this indicates the end of a maneuver. The end of the sequence has a double line. So here we pull hard, we float over the top, so we have zero to two Gs depending on the aircraft and your personal uh, technique. And that's a loop. The Elmerman is half a loop and then a, a roll at the top. And this is the most difficult portion right here is to do a roll at a very slow speed because the controls are not very effective. Okay. This is, uh, oops, sorry. This guy right here is doing a loop in a uh, Boeing 720. It's one of the, I believe that's the aircraft. It was one of the, what became the 707 KC-135 and like aircraft. And that's it on the right. And his name was Tex Johnson out in the Boeing field. And he was demonstrating the aircraft to the airline representatives who were thinking about buying this. And he says, watch this. And that's what he did. He did a roll, and I think he did a loop too, I believe. <laughs> Very cool. Um, but it just shows the strength of that aircraft, which is uh, indicative of the aircraft such as the 730, uh, I'm sorry, the KC-10, I'm sorry, the KC-135, uh, uh, which is this aircraft with a boom and fuel inside that we used to air, air refuel off of. They're basically gone. There's not too many of them left, and they're replaced by the KC-10. And I understand there's another aircraft that's going to be taking that place. Um, and the B-52, strong airplanes, great longevity. By the way, your, your little airplanes that you fly, that you will fly or have flown, have an indefinite life, which is interesting. Um, whereas military airplanes, they'll have either six or 10 years, depending on whether they're fighters or bombers or transports. Hammerhead, basically you pull up to the vertical, you're looking out the side to make sure you're vertical, when you hit a certain speed and the aircraft talks to you, in other words, the aileron is so far over because the airplane starts to torque in the vertical, you kick hard left rudder because the propeller turns to the right and it's much harder to make a, uh, the, the aircraft turn to the right into the uh, centrifugal force of the aircraft. So you kick left, go straight down, and then pull out. And this is something I'm still trying to figure out. Okay, the spin. Basically, you can see that the helical path that this, this aircraft makes, much like a feather or those uh, oak um, seeds that fall off the tree, they go down. Basically, that's what it is. You go up and do a spin for the first time, it's scary. I will admit that. Um, and we talked to you about this. A good aerobatic instructor who teaches you spins, or any aerobatics for that matter, 
will, should put you at ease by explaining not only what the maneuver looks like, but also how it feels, the descending elevator. And they talk to you while they're doing the maneuver. Okay, we're gonna stall the airplane, now we're gonna kick right, here's the falling feeling. And so when you're ready for it, that manifestation of apprehension is less. Uh, the fear of the unknown, because how many of you have done, how many of you have done spin other than, okay, what'd you do it in? Oh, okay, cool. Glider? Oh my God. Hi, how are you? I can't remember your name. Oh, Christian, how are you? Did I, did I throw up that time? No, no, okay, good. I usually do, you, you, you know that. Scares the living daylights out of me, but they pay me, so I do it. <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, um, that's the whole idea, is to put you at ease, to make it make sense, so that you, uh, you get to a point where you understand it, and then when you go out by yourself, you can avoid spins, but if you ever were to experience a spin, you can recover. Okay. The bug. Uh, try it once, you will either want to learn more, once is enough. Oxana, how long did it take you to fall in love with aerobatics? Um, I think after two months, I, I was not as sick as the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't ask you about that. I asked you about when did you fall in love with <laughs> Can I tell you this, tell the story about your, your class now? Okay, no, okay. We, we'll keep it our secret. Um, so usually the reaction we, we, we get from people is they either want to learn more or once is enough. And they say, nope, seen enough, you taught me, thank you very much, and I'm going to go back to fly my Cessna or Warrior or other air, uh, training aircraft. And that's fine. Where I teach, we want you to know everything beyond what the FAA wants you to know, in this case, spins. If you take a aerobatic training, training should be structured and rely on a syllabus. So when you walk in any training, uh, I, I built syllabuses. Uh, fortunately, one of our instructors up at uh, National New Hampshire had a wonderful syllabus. I brought it up to date, and now we're using those. Our instructor used a syllabus. They're required to by me and the owner, Mark Holsworth. Uh, and you should always insist on a syllabus to know not only what you're going to do, but what you've been doing and what you have to repeat, and also the references within that syllabus, what books to read. Um, why do we learn aerobatics? To increase your uh, situational awareness. For those who uh, have already flown, your instructor should be saying, look outside, use the airplane as your reference. Reference the, the nose and the parts of the aircraft against the horizon. And that's really the right way to do it because we want you to look for other aircraft. Um, you fly aerobatics, we don't have an attitude indicator and other things in the aircraft. We have an airspeed and an altimeter, and that's really all you need to fly aerobatics because everything is referenced outside, and that's where your eyes should be. Flying aerobatics increases your situational awareness in that respect. You have a much better feel for the aircraft. Um, you can tell when it's getting slow by what you hear, what you feel, and what you see, and it becomes part of you, um, you or you become part of the aircraft. How many of you ride horses? Okay become one with a horse. Very much the same, um, and you can, you can forecast what the horse is going to do, you can forecast what the aircraft is going to do. I do this, and I do it too much, the airplane snaps out of control, I better not do that too much. Um, you're able to recover from unusual attitudes, and learning aerobatics in itself, you're going to go into unusual attitudes, and you will recover from unusual attitudes. Train to know where to look in an aircraft uh, pilot operating handbook for information that impacts the aircraft controllability, unusual attitudes, and spin recoveries, um, especially spin recoveries, okay? Understand pursuit curves. What's a pursuit curve? A pursuit curve talks about avoiding other aircraft, and I, ha I put this in there because I want you to know about this if you're flying or going to fly. Basically, in the military, or before I went in the military and flying along as a student pilot, another airplane would show up and I would just move the airplane. I had no idea what I was doing. Get in the military and they said, all you have to do is take your nose, point it behind that other aircraft, and you will guarantee miss, miss them. This is one of the things that we teach you about collision avoidance. Okay. Um, 
makes you a better instrument pilot. It's very interesting. I had a friend, uh, a fellow who I, I met, who we are now friends, and I was teaching him aerobatics. At the same time, he was already an instrument-rated pilot, and he owned a twin-engine aircraft. And his other instructor, who was uh, helping him maintain his currency and proficiency, uh, came to me and said, what are you doing with this guy? And I went, geez, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean, what am I doing with him? He says, all of a sudden, his instrument skills have improved dramatically. He handles the airplane as almost as if he's one with the airplane. And I got to thinking about it, and it occurred to me that because of aerobatics, he would feel the aircraft change in attitude or airspeed before it actually showed up on the instruments. All the instruments have a lag, minute, but they do lag to a, to a very small degree. He could feel the airplane change. You're looking at his approach chart, and you feel the airplane, he corrected, and you go, oh. It didn't move because I because he saw it. You think about you think about the you think about the fighter pilot who goes up and takes off in maybe two or three hundred foot ceilings and climbs up to a higher altitude, does air combat, really scrambles his inner ear like Tina was uh, explaining to you, and vertigo and all that, and yet they can still take that airplane and land in minimum weather conditions. We did it all the time, especially in Germany when I was stationed there. Um, a good day was 300 feet and, and a mile visibility. That was a good day. It's because of the aerobatics, because we feel the airplane, because we know to have a light touch on the stick to make sure that we're not over controlling the airplane. Even if we have vertigo, we know to look at that attitude indicator and everything centers around the attitude indicator. Now. We can talk about vertical, but there's another phenomenon called the wobblies, which we don't have time to really get into. But if you learn aerobatics and you go positive, negative, positive, or negative, positive, negative, you get the wobblies, which is a whole new type of vertigo. Very interesting. OK. OK. Uh, aircraft handling. Um, these are some of Oxana's slides, I think. And Phil uh, put the pictures in here. Um, they talk about the spade, which is that guy right there. Okay, it's right underneath, and it's attached to the aileron. I call that poor man's um, uh, power steering, basically. Without that plate, and it's a plate, so when the aileron goes up, the plate goes down, the air hits, it helps the aileron go up. Uh, smaller surface than the aileron, and it lightens the aileron loads. I've seen them on rudders. and. Uh, so this, the whole idea is to lighten the load. It helps that aileron go up. And I'll tell you, having flown the original Cetabrias and, and uh, Decathlons when they came out without these, my right arm was about that big until I became somewhat sedentary. Okay. Uh, forces on the stick and pedal from very heavy to unresponsive controls. The slower you get, especially when you're up here or at the top of the, any looping maneuver, you can sit there and go like this. And if your instructor, you have a good instructor, they will show you this in your aircraft. For example, in slow flight, uh, what I demonstrate to my students, and I tell them, I say, I'm going to move the controls around very rapidly, but when we're really, really slow, and you'll see that they have no effect. And I go like this, and I go like this, and I hit the rudder, and the airplane will move, barely move. Um, I got that idea flying on the tanker because uh, in Germany they wouldn't allow the KC-135. They had us refuel off a of KC-97 at 230 knots as opposed to 310 knots. And you could sit there and go like this all day, stuck in the boom, and the airplane wouldn't move. And I thought, gee, this is a great thing that I could be teaching to my students and pass on to any instructors that I have met to have them teach it too. So what does that mean? Slow, the airplane requires more control input than it does at a higher speed. Um, okay. No, I'm not going to tell you that story because I don't know if the FAA is here, so we're going to let that one. Um, OK. Uh, let's see. P factor, gyro effects, et cetera, are more pronounced. Uh, the gyroscopic effect is really, eh, we don't really see that, that much in these little airplanes. The big round engine airplanes that you saw in World War II, that would be more more uh, evident. The P factor is the most predominant turning force, and it always turns to the left in American-made engines that rotate clockwise as you sit in the cockpit. Okay, And your instructor should explain this to you. In aerobatics, 
we, we also have phenomenon that makes the, instead of when we get slow and high power setting, the nose will go left because of this P factor. If we dive the airplane because some engines are offset about one degree to the right, or if you look at our decathlon, the, the uh, vertical stabili stabilizer that the rudder is attached to is one degree to the left. And so as you dive, the airplane will go right, requiring left rudder. Um, so the whole idea in any competition is to make the airplane go straight. And knowing this, you can be prepared for it because the judges can see these things. If you come down and you say, well, I think I really fooled the judges. And you look and you got a five on a maneuver and you say, well, I guess I didn't fool the judge even though I paid them off. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, so I'm sorry. Um, I gotta watch what I say. Um, aircraft stability. Uh, when we talk about stability, we, um, uh, if, if when, you, when you think about a fighter, they're incredibly unstable. And we see a lot of airplanes with that dihedral, the, the bending up of the wings. That adds to stability, amongst other things. Um, but we want the airliners, because of big, heavy airplanes, and we certainly want the fighters to be very responsive. In those aircraft, they have installed stability augmentation systems. And uh, I didn't know what that was when I first started flying an older, older uh, fighter called the F-4. How many know what an F-4 is? You're either very smart or very old like me. <laughs> But nonetheless, um, they had us fly the airplane, then we turned the stability augmentation system, and here's this rock-solid airplane we could, really, oops, we could really roll and do different things with, and it would sit there and it would just, doggone it, it would just go back and forth all over the place. It, would, it was as if the aircraft were balanced on the pin, the head of a pin, and they have us do it with the, with the, uh, the aircraft, and I flew both the 727 and the MD-11, which is, the MD-11 is the next one down from a 747. It's 630,000 gross pounds gross weight. And we turn off the stability augmentation, the airplane would do the same thing. I thought, gee, that's awfully familiar. So if you lose those things, it makes the airplane a lot harder to fly. Um, with aerobatic airplanes, they're a little bit twitchy, but it depends on the design. The people who design the aerobatics airplanes are really smart. Decathlon is probably the most stable aircraft to fly, whereas the Pitts is a little less stable. The extra, believe it or not, when you start moving the controls around a lot, it becomes a lot less stable unless you're making small movements. And in my aircraft, the previous owner put in instruments so I could fly approaches in it, believe it or not. I'm not allowed to because it's not certified for that, but if I ever get stuck, I have the things that I need to, to crack the weather, so to speak. Um, and I practiced that. And son of a gun, the airplane is very stable. Any mistakes were mine. Okay, different airplanes. This is our Super Decathlon. This is uh, fairly new. It's only a couple years old. Great trainer, great trainer, and uh, very stable, very forgiving, and uh, a great in, uh, initial aerobatic training uh, aircraft. Uh, then we have the Yak-52. This was made in Czechoslovakia or China. Some have fixed gear, some have uh, retractable gear, fairly cheap. Big engine, I think it's 340 horsepower, something like that. Big, big engine. We have a pit special. This is a uh, S1T because you can see the uh, cow flap down there. And you should learn about cow flaps when you get into more advanced high performance aircraft. They, that's one way of controlling the heat in the engine. And then we have the extra, which is incredible airplane. A lot of fun. We have the Game Bird. Um, I don't know that much about it. I think Phil went out to the factory and talked to them. Plus, my, plus and minus 10. Uh, take off, TOW is takeoff weight up to 880 kilograms, 1,940 pounds. Long range tanks. Um, they can go very, very far and fairly fast. <coughs> Excuse me, up to 200 knots. When they talk about the load factor of plus and minus 6 Gs, that's when you add more weight. They, re they reduce the uh, amount of uh, Gs that you can uh, fly this aircraft to. With, the with fuel in the wings, aerobatics, and intentional spins are prohibited because of the center of gravity. Now, this is uh, one of uh, Oxana's. Th that's my pits that I had at one time. That was a lot of fun, cheap, 
and, um, and it was cheaper than therapy. <laughs> really was. How do we strengthen the airplane? Well, on our decathlon, <clears throat> we have these flying wires here, okay? And we pre-flight them. <coughs> Excuse me. And we, we check them for their tension. So they all should be a, pretty close to each other. <coughs> Pardon me. Over here, we have the wing of an airplane like the decathlon. You can see the internal braces here. These are the same flying wires, but they're internal to the engine. <coughs> Excuse me. The G meter. Um, very simply, <coughs> this is the G meter. This is what it looks like in our decathlon. And all you have to do is take your weight and multiply it by what you see on here. So if you weigh 150 pounds, 150 times 2 your weight is now 300 pounds. Um, oh, by the way, this is Oxana. This is you, right? That's you? Yeah. That's a, what, an L30, not, no. L20. That's the, not the Iskra, that's. No. <coughs> Excuse me. That, okay. That, that G meter will let you know if the previous uh, pilot bent the airplane. There you go. That's a good point. So we have the limitations on there. The red line, just like in your airspeed indicator, the red line is uh, now the airplane's going to break. I, didn't, I did not include a strength diagram, but basically it talks about airspeed versus G. In other words, the faster you go, the more G you can pull, both positive and negative. And there are limits. We talk about the Gs on an aircraft. Green, of course, is good, stoplight mentality. Yellow is caution. We don't want to go in there too many times because now we're overstressing the airplane and eventually things are going to bend and twist and possibly the aircraft will, uh, will, uh, will break apart. The red line means anything past that, then we're going to have structural damage. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Philip put in, oops, this is, oops, let me go back. This is uh, interesting because <clears throat> this also talks about the game bird and the uh, Gs, but it also talks about the minimum and maximum airspeed for ent entering. My airplane, the extra is 210 knots is, about, is the limit. His, uh, this airplane is 234 knots. So if you're going to do a quarter loop up, the minimum speed that the airplane will make it over the top is 100 knots, and you can do it as high as 234 knots. The quick release right here is the harness. You get into the airplane. You have two releases to get, to get out of the airplane. The next slide talks about the door if we have to get out. This is the inside of a decathlon. As you can see, the instructor sits back here. And sometimes I'm awake uh, if you fly with me. I'm not sure. And then you're up here, and that's the trim. The other controls, of course, are in front of you, just like uh, any other airplane. Just like this. So this is, this is what our decathlon looks like in the front. Over here we have, uh, let's see, this is not ours, but very similar. We have um, the mixture, the throttle, alternate air since it's fuel injected, the prop control for the constant speed uh, controllable prop. And then you can see we don't have any attitude indicator. We don't need this. We're real pilots. We don't need an attitude indicator. We can do it without that but we have an airspeed and altimeter. Luxury item, vertical speed, you're never going to look at that during um, aerobatic maneuvers. And the uh, G meter over here, and then the engine controls, over, or the engine indicating instruments here. Mark, where, where's the door hinge release in case you have to the, uh, jump out with your parachute? OK, this, this is the door on the right side, so it's right here. Right by your right knee is the release. And I, I made up a book of this aircraft, so before you ever get there, you can look and see where, oops, see where all the parts are uh, on the aircraft. Right by your right knee, there's a, there's a lever with a pin that keeps you from pulling the lever, unless you really want to get rid of the door. You pull the pin, you pull the lever, and, the, and it unhinges the door. You just simply push it out to get out of the airplane. So we have a way of getting out of the airplane. 
91303 defines aerobatic flight and specifies where you can do aerobatics. Um, the fact that you need to wear a parachute, but you don't always have to wear a parachute. Now, you all did aerobatics and spins. Were you wearing a parachute? I don't see you. No. Were you alone? No. You were with an instructor doing spins. OK. OK. I think gliders are included in this, but that's illegal. And people go out and they do aerobatics, and it irks me because I don't, you know, I, yeah, I'm a by the book kind of person. Keep, keep running the slides, Mark. I think there is an exception if you're doing spin training for CFI. I, I'm going to cover that. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to cover that. It, but maybe he didn't. But need when people go out there and take a ride in a Waco or some of these other aircraft as a ride and they don't have parachutes, I said, I asked them, how, how was it? And, they, and then I asked them, did you wear a parachute? And they said, no. That to me is risking somebody else's life. And I, and I can't say that I appreciate it. I think that's foolhardy. Why would we wear a parachute? Um, people rent our airplanes, just go places. They really don't want a parachute. That's fine. But I'm going to wear it because if it catches on fire, we have a structural failure, we go into the weather, we have a way out. Why not take that insurance uh, with you? Um, so when you don't have to wear a parachute is when you're the sole occupant doing aerobatics. You don't have to wear a parachute. Again, I, I'm going to wear a parachute. Um, also, if you're going to be certified as a flight instructor, then in your training for spins, you go up and do spins, then you do not have to wear a parachute. But at East Coast Aero Club, we have you wear the parachute. Um, okay. There are no aerobatic ratings. Um, anybody, any flight instructor can teach you aerobatics and sign your logbook. Uh, again, if somebody says, I'm an aerobatic instructor, I, the first thing I'm going to say is, what's your experience? Have you been in any competitions? Uh, what's your experience? Where's the syllabus? And, uh, but people say, well, I do it all the time. Well, I have people who tell me, well, I fly formation all the time. And I ask them, well, how close do you get? And they say, well, I can barely see the other person. To me, that's the same way, same day, as opposed to being three feet away or wing overlap if you're in the weather that we did in the military. Okay, the regulations are um, very strict, and you can read these, but the bottom line is if you do aerobatics, even over a single house, you're in violation of the regulations. I have a friend I used to fly with, uh, or I knew at, um, uh, at an airline years gone by. He retired and uh, is now with the, the Portland Flight Standards District Office, the FISDO in Portland calls me up and he says, hey, great to catch up with you. And by the way, we're thinking about violating one of the pilots flying your airplane. I go, ugh, OK, what did he do? People were complaining that they were doing aerobatics right over the house. So I have to talk to that person. And now I've built an aerobatic area that they can fly in. And we demand that they fly over that. OK. Um, back to the parachute. Uh, they have to be pack, repacked every 180 days. These are the synthetic materials, not the silk. The silk, I think it's every 90 days, something like that. Better to buy a brand new parachute or get one that's used that's in good condition. They repack them in several different places. One of the places where I have my, the place I have mine repacked is uh, at uh, uh, the sports center in Pepperell, Mass. Don Mayer has been doing it since he was that high. And uh, so I trust Don. Um, okay. Physiology. Okay. Effects of G is less or no blood reaches the brain and the eyes. Our, our blood is made up of certain compounds, one of which is hemoglobin that carries the oxygen molecule to your brain. Um, so, how does the how do, over, how do the Gs manifest themselves? And when you, when you fly this, when you fly aerobatics, you may experience. Some people don't. Um, when I first started flying, I was about four or five Gs. And then they taught me to grunt, crunch my tummy, to hold the blood up in the upper extremities, especially in my brain. Um, so it manifests itself, the over Gs, or the Gs, by graying out. But basically, you don't do that first. You start to lose your peripheral vision. 
What you also don't realize is that you start to lose the ability to discern colors because there's no oxygen. And we find this by going in the altitude chamber, the hyperbolic chamber. Uh, for example, we go up, they take all the oxygen out, we take off our masks, and we try to write, and we do silly, goofy, goofy things. And, um, <clears throat> and then they say, okay, put your oxygen mask on and look at this chart over here, and it's all grays. You put the oxygen mask on, go in 100% oxygen, all of a sudden it, bla it, it just explodes into all these colors. You go, wow. I thought it was gray, but in fact, it was the lack of oxygen is uh, manifesting itself with the inability to discern colors. So I work with a, uh, a gentleman named uh, uh, um, Gross, who was Mr. Martin Baker. That's the ejection seat in a lot of the early fighters. And uh, I went out there to fix one of our jets, the fleet, and we had a long conversation about, um, about the uh, la lack of, lack of or the loss of consciousness um, in the F-16 when they first came, came out. Here's an airplane. You can take that side control and go like this, and the airplane says, you want 9Gs and you want it right now? Sure, I'll do that. And the airplane uh, over-Gs the pilot, not the aircraft, and they go through all the phases of the blackout to the point where they pass out, and he says the average time of loss of consciousness was about three to three and a half minutes. And uh, whoa! I see. And he said that it takes that long for them to wake back up. Amazing. And we were looking at the shrouds of helmets. This is a rather morbid thing here, but um, of the uh, the pilots who who lost consciousness, flew into the ground, and this guy could tell where they were looking, where their hands were, and where their feet were, at the time of impact. And he he explained that when their head was down, the white wires in the instrument panel in the HUD area, or below the HUD area, was all up here. If they were looking straight ahead, it would be all down in here. Um, I was lucky enough to be trained by the University of Southern California to go out and investigate mishaps. Uh, as a chief of flight safety for a command, I'm the guy who set up the boards, and I say, you, you, and you are going to go investigate. You're the president. And then I would go and check on them, make sure they were doing it right. And the amazing things that I, that I found out um, by doing that, it was, it was quite an education. So how do we counteract this? Now, in the private pilot course, you're required to do a 45-degree bank turn. If you go to 60 degrees, now you will weigh twice your weight. 45 is somewhere less than that. But it's a cool thing to try and do. Try 50 degrees of bank. Put your hand up and see that it falls down because uh, sometimes we don't really feel the Gs. But if you feel like you're losing your per peripheral vision, Crunch your tummy. And if you can, think about it, crunch your thighs. How many times have you heard that? Crunch your tummy, crunch your tummy. And that keeps you from um, uh, realizing the effects of the, of the Gs. Negative Gs is when we push the airplane with the stick forward. All the blood now rushes to our head, and we can break the little, what is it, corpuscles in your, in your eyes. I took a young man flying, and all he wanted to do was negative Gs, um, a friend of mine. Kind of crazy. So I took him up in the extra. We did about two negative Gs. You know, in competition, we'll do as much as four negative Gs. And I came down and looked at his eyes, and I said, I think I see some uh, busted blood vessels. He goes, yeah, I can't wait to go to school to show my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, the story I want to tell you about the negative Gs is that there are hazards with that. Um, investigating a mishap. F-15, two F-15s, two F-4s going 2v2, new F-4 uh, uh, flight lead. Wingman says, I see the F-15s, and there are different altitudes. For example, the F-15s would be evens, like two, four, six, so on and so forth, and the F-15s would be odds, altitudes. And so the lead says, well, I can't see them, but I, yeah, we'll just go ahead and down and get into their block. Go down. Lead F-4 takes the tail off of one of the F-15s. The F-15 pilot goes negative G to the point where he's basically plastered against the canopy. His, his eyes are engorged in blood. He can't see anything except red. And he can't reach his ejection seat handle. In the F-4, we had a handle up here, and we also have a handle down here. F-15 only has a handle down below. He goes through one positive G cycle, ejects, and, and he comes out. And he's telling me this from the hospital. By the way, I call him up 
to explain that I need to know what happened early on so that we can keep this from happening again. So he's telling me the story, and he says, I'm coming down in the chute. My feet hit the water, and he says, oh, yeah, I remember. You go down, you come up, and then you go down, and you drown, and that's it. He goes down. He comes up. He goes, <gasps> puts his hand right in his raft. You go out. The raft automatically deploys on a lanyard, and he, it la ended up right next to him. There, but for the grace of God, go I. I mean, I was so happy to hear that this guy was okay. And... Um, but he said he couldn't see anything because his eyes were engorged in blood. So that's a story of negative Gs. The typical human limits, uh, plus 5 to plus 7 and minus 2 to 3, uh, that's normally about right. Um, but what affects Gs? It's your physical health um, and also the environment and whether you take care of yourself. To give an example, I'm a t I was a 10G person. I, I, I haven't pulled 10Gs in a while. There's no need to. But when I'm teaching, some people go, er, and they pull 10Gs on me, and as I said, I was as tall as Philip, and now I'm not. So nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, um, um, when, uh, when, I, when I go to competitions with my students, at times I was flying with five of them, then I'd fly myself in 90 degree weather, high humidity, and I wasn't hydrating enough. And I was blacking out, I mean blacking out at four Gs, because not enough water and the high humidity. Uh, the G-suit. The G-suit, when I went through back in the 70s and I was flying in the 80s, uh, would constrict your calves, your thighs, and your belly. And it was very attractive, by the way, it, you know, green. And uh, as you pulled, there was a little button on the left side that had a weight in it. And as the button went down, as you pull more, as a result of pulling more Gs, it would let more air into the G-suit. Um, now I think they have an upper suit because of the higher Gs. They can go to 9 Gs. Our airplane, the F-4, the Century Series airplanes were normally about 8 to 9 Gs. The F-4 was 9 Gs. Uh, but they would limit us to 5 or 6 Gs so that the airplane would last in a non-combat environment. If we go out in combat, then we could pull the limits of the aircraft. Somebody gets behind me, I'm pulling more than the limits if that were to happen, to tell you the truth. Um, We have two courses, and uh, a good school, I think, will have at least two courses. Uh, unusual attitude recovery, where you go out and you just do unusual attitude recoveries. We also offer to do this, and at the end we say, hey, you want to do a loop and a roll? And we have you do a loop and a roll. They're so simple, we simply talk you through it. But we talk you through it to do it safely as well. Um, The aerobatics course, um, in, in our school, it's 10 flights. Uh, some people say 10 hours. We say 10 flights in competency. You can take the airplane by yourself. And we teach competition aerobatics. <clears throat> so for example, in a spin, for you people who've done the spins, when you go in around, you stop the airplane's rotation with the rudder, release the back pressure, and you had maybe an angle something like this below the horizon. Then you just pull up. In competition, we stop the rotation, push the nose to vertical, draw a line, it can be very short if you wish, to gain airspeed, then back to level. Okay. So at, when you finish, you have to look at the wing, you push to the vertical, back up in front, look at the airspeed, and then pull as you're adding power. And as I mentioned, uh, where I teach, we also offer the pre-solo um, spin training. Uh, so in the upset and pre-solo training, we teach five spin entries. Now, this is where you want to listen up, because if an examiner asks you about spins, which if you come to, to me, I will, not because I want to, it's because the FAA makes me ask you about spins. You have to have knowledge of spins. But basically, in order to spin an aircraft, you, two things, the aircraft must realize two things. One is a stall. In this case, it'll be a power-off stall. Pull apart to idle, power off stall, and then something must cause rotation. Now, we know if we kick that rudder, that will yaw the nose, and then the aircraft will spin. What else can cause rotation or yaw? The P factor. So if we add power and we slow the airplane down by raising the nose and add more power, when it stalls because the nose is so high and the critical angle of attack has, you covered critical angle of attack? Okay. 
when the critical angle attack has been reached, the airplane, because of that left turning tendency, will then spin to the left, which it does. It's like magic. And you never touch the rudders. The other one is adverse yaw. Cover, okay. Adverse yaw, the down aileron, creates more drag than the up aileron because it goes down to an area of higher relative pressure, uh, pressure relative to the low pressure on top of the wing. That also causes drag. So in a spin, one of the questions that you could be asked, this is a little bit beyond what I would ask a private or commercial, but I would ask a CFI possibly, is if you're in a left spin, which way should you move the ailerons? The answer is opposite, I'm sorry, into the spin. Because if you go to the left, which aileron goes up? Does anybody know which aileron goes up if you push the left, the ailerons to the left? You don't count. <laughs> the left one. So the right one goes down. Where's the most drag? It's the down aileron. So that actually will slow the rotation down. And in the extra, it actually talks about that using in-spin ailerons. Um, I was teaching, uh, well, we can teach you recovery from inverted flight, uh, wake turbulence from by, flying behind another aircraft. At another flight school, I taught our instructors how to be lead, and I would take the airplane and fly in the wake turbulence of another airplane to show them the rolling effects and the fact that it spits you out. You get behind a larger aircraft, it, the wake turbulence, the vorticine, you've taught them about wake turbulence, okay, um, is much larger, larger, and your aircraft, being smaller, can be caught inside of that, and it will roll. Had an experience as a post-solo, pre-private student. I was learning aerobatics. I was very fortunate. My dad had an aerobatic airplane, and he taught me a lot of aerobatics, and he would constantly roll the airplane unexpectedly on me, and then I had to recover, simulating wake turbulence. We get behind another aircraft at Norwood Airport. I'm rolled inverted, and uh, I went, wow, look at this. And then I realized, ooh, this is the wake turbulence my dad trained me for. And we had already passed knife edge, and we were headed for inverted, and I rolled the airplane all the way around, scared the living daylights out of me. And the engine quit, because I was taught to push a little bit when you're inverted, and then the engine caught. We landed, my instructor, who was there, didn't do anything. And he turned to me and he says, wow, you just saved my life. And I said, no, I didn't, I saved my life. <laughs> What kind of aircraft was it that generated that? It was a Cherokee one. Oh, it was a Cherokee 140 I was in, and I think it was a Navajo, but I'm not really sure. Wow. And which is very odd. I don't recall the aircraft. I just think it might have been. It might have been something larger. But uh, it was just inattention on my part, non intervention by the instructor. Nice guy, but he just sat there and didn't do anything. And I let it go until I went, well, oh, maybe I ought to do something about this. Um, so, in aerobatics in the um, primary sequence, which is normally the first sequence that you will do or the first <coughs> level of competition that you will do, uh, these are some of the maneuvers that you will be doing. Uh, 45 degree turn, cap it off, one turn spin. And I'll show you, I'll show you uh, uh, pictures of the actual sequences for this year. Uh, one half cubit eight, that's two-thirds of a loop. You end up on a 45-degree down line. You count 1,001, 1,002, roll, 1,001, 1,002, pull to make the, lines, the, li the length of the line prior to the roll the same as the length of the line after the roll. Um, uh, loop, 180-degree competition turn. And this is the one that will spill the coffee of your passengers. Okay, so don't do this with passengers because when we turn, it's a coordination of rudder and aileron until the bank is reached, and then we neutralize those control, and because we lost part of that vertical lift component, we need a little bit of back pressure, and we slowly turn the airplane. In competition, think of a rusty bolt, and you have to stop. You have to hold that bank for about a second. It just has to be a perceived uh, stop. You pull to 90, 180, or 270 degrees, and normally the amount of turn that you will do in competition, let's make it 90 degrees. So you stop, takes top rudder and a little bit of forward stick, and then you neutralize the rudder and pull the stick back to turn, and you stop again with forward, rudder, or forward stick and top rudder, and then more top rudders you roll out to do coordinated. It'll drive you crazy when you do this, when you first start doing it, because it is harder than it looks. Um, we volunteer our times, our aerobatic instructors volunteer our times at competitions 
and we can act as safety pilots up through the intermediate level. <clears throat> so when you go to fly, one goes to fly, aerobatics, at practices and contests, we can be in the airplane to keep you safe. At practices, we can help talk to you or we can talk to you while you're doing the maneuvers to help you through uh, the maneuver and perfect them, along with the judges on the ground watching you and critiquing you in competition, all we can say is, don't forget your wing wags. That's the way you signal the, the judges, and then we have to be quiet. We can't say anything unless we're going to die. And then we intervene. Kind of a self-preservation. My insurance requires that. <laughs> so the instructor serves the safety pilot. Um, the start taxi and takeoff, the start, you have a starter in competition. Somebody comes over, you, over to you and says, start your engine, go taxi over there. And then you listen to the chief judge on the frequency, and they say, uh, um, Joe Bag of Donuts, go ahead and take off. And you take off, and you hold. They have a place to hold outside the aerobatic box, which I'll show you in a moment. And then the chief judge comes up, and he says, Joe Bag of Donuts, the chief judge. And you say, this is Joe. <laughs> say, Joe, the box is yours. Have a great flight. You come in. You do your sequence. It takes maybe two or three minutes to go through the primary. It seems like when you come out the other end of it, it seems like it, was, it never happened. It's, the most, it's very strange. Tina talked about stress. Competition is, is stress, but it's a wonderful stress. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, thing to go out and compete uh, and to, uh, to say, I've done this and have fun. Um, OK. The aerobatic box is 3,300 feet by 3,300 feet, so it's uh, less than a mile for the primary and the, um, and the uh, sportsman, which is the next level up. The bottom of the box is 1,500 feet AGL, and you're allowed up to 3,500 feet AGL. The judges really don't, they're not concerned about the height so long as they can see you, uh, but they are worried about the, the lower level. If you go over, um, if you go too low, they will disqualify you. So when we get to the airfield, we set our altimeters to zero. We have an X and Y axis. So here's the uh, 3,300 feet by 3,300 feet, the X axis. So let's just say the judges are on my right. This would be the X axis. To or from the judges is the Y axis. And there's way of, uh, ways of using those axes to, um, to maintain your position in the box. Wing wags, you got to do it. Uh, and there's different rules about how you do those. That's to alert the judges that you're inbound. If you don't do it, they take uh, uh, points from you. Um, OK. Flying the maneuver, setting the lines and angles. Um, really, it's, again, it's looking outside the aircraft. So if you're doing a 45 degree up, you look at the left side where the site is. And there is a site that has looks like a spider web that has all the angles on it. Um, Making the loops round and the competition turn. Uh, let's see. That'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Judging criteria, penalties. You get penalties for doing certain things. Getting too low, flying outside the box. Um, brakes, if you get disoriented or get too low, you can brake by wagging your wings. And you can start over again, but you're assessed points if you do that. The K factor. Oops. IAC philosophy. Basically, when you get there, somebody will mentor you. So when Oksana uh, started aerobatics, I mentored her to make sure that she was taken care of and, uh, somebody, and to help her through the first couple of competition. Now she's on her own. She just goes and, and does it on her own. Um, the K factor, to calculate it, um, we add up the parts. So this maneuver consists of a line and, and a roll, a slow roll. Um, so the straight and level flight is 1.1. Uh, That's the uh, family of this figure. And this is the family of the slow roll. The k factor for straight and level is 2. The k factor for a for a total of 10. So it depends on how many, um, how well you do. And then they subtract from that if you, if you have a good maneuver or not. This is the snap roll, half loop, half roll. And, a, and an outside snap. This next one is uh, talks about judging the vertical. Um, basically, it's based on um, on your um, <coughs> aircraft attitude. I'm hurrying up because I see the time. Um, 
The next one talks about keeping the aircraft in the aerobatic box. The next one talks about the angles that you and the length of the lines. And this one talks about the, uh, the effects of wind. The sequence, your first few years, you can expect to fly these. If you have a more advanced airplane, then you can move up. Um, I'm just going to throw one sequence up here since we are a little time limited. Tina, you want to grab that? Yeah, Mark, you don't have to get through it all because I'm sure there's going to be some questions. So Yeah, let me uh, give you this. Don't feel pressured to. OK. This is the. Um, I checked the regulation, by the way, and I think Mark is correct that uh, unless the spin training is required for the rating, uh, you have to wear a parachute. So it's only required for CFI at this point. Therefore, when you were doing your glider heroics, uh, you should oh. have been wearing a chute, since the glider private does not require spin training. Can you, can you do that? I'm it's uh, obviously it. wise. <laughs> so this is the unlimited. Uh, unlimited right here. Um, you can, the, the red is negative Gs. You're pushing the stick forward. So this would be level, pull to the vertical, a snap roll, which is really a directed spin. Same inputs, but done very quickly out of an accelerated stall. You covered that? Accelerated stall? No, we didn't. OK. Um, Tina will cover, and Phil will cover that at a later time. And then as you pull around to a 45 degree down line, a two point roll, and then back to level, okay? So are there any questions? I'm gonna ask the first question of Mark while you uh, folks are thinking of your questions. Uh, but what I, from what I've heard and what I felt, the spin is actually one of the maneuvers that's most likely to make a person motion sick. So isn't it kind of a shame that uh, you know, an aileron roll is 1G all the way around. That's why that guy was able to do that with the airliner without bending anything, because the airliner, uh, if it's done properly, doesn't know that it's ever departed from straight and level flight. Um, but uh, so what do, what do you think? Isn't it kind of a shame that for a lot of people, if they go right up through CFI, it may be the case that the only aerobatics that they've done is that spin, and they got out of there saying, whoa, that didn't feel so good. Yeah. I. I, I uh, you're, you're correct. Um, although I have people that they do a loop and then they're done. They get sick. Um, little trick, if you get air sick, um, before you go up the next time, take a Pepsi. And it's, I don't know what is the reason why the Pepsi works. Pop the top, let it go flat, and take a couple sips before you go up. And then when you land, it seems to work. It seems to abate uh, air sickness. There's also the wristbands. You can get them from Sporty Spotless Chop that uh, work on my wife who is, has a middle ear issue. She goes up in the extra. She, we don't do any aerobatics, but she doesn't get ear sick. Other, any, other, other questions? Yes, sir. Um, what are the main differences between the uh, the aerobatics and the aerobatics? Yeah, uh, the difference between the Cessna 172 Warrior, the aircraft that you train for your pilot certificates, as opposed to aerobatic uh, aircraft, the G limits. And even when you look in the, for example, the Cessna 172 has two categories. Um, one is the normal category, and the other one is the uh, utility category. Utility cat category, less weight in the airplane, you can pull more Gs. Also, stability and control authority. You know, the decathlon or an aerobatic plane may be less stable, and uh, it'll have way more aileron and rudder authority. Yeah. Sir, you had a question? Is this done anywhere where you can observe it? Um, <laughs> the people who normally observe, it, d observe this are the ones who, uh, well, they, they, yes, the ones who uh, filed the noise complaints, unfortunately. So as people <laughs> like you, we'd, lo we'd love to see. But uh, we have aerobatic practices and competitions. Keen, uh, you can call uh, East Coast Aero Club, and they can tell you when these practices. And, and then you come out there and be right there with us, and we'll explain what's going on. Any other questions? People can come up also. So we'll see you all up. Uh, for anybody who doesn't want to come up and ask Mark a question, uh, please, please feel free to come up. Uh, um, but for everybody else, let's wrap it now. And then uh, Well, there was one question more somebody was asking about uh, using their glider time towards a certificate. Is that oh. person here? Yeah, yes, you can. You look in the regular line to Part 61, wherever it says single engine aircraft, then you have to fly a powered aircraft. Anything that says training, it must be have the instructor in the airplane. Okay, welcome.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark.